Hello, I'm Rupert Sheldrake, and I'm here with Mark Vernon. Hello, Mark. Hi there, Rupert. Um, in another of our dialogues, Sheldrake Vernon, Vernon Dialogues. Um, and Mark, today, uh, as we speak from our locked down uh, homes in London, um, to protect us against the virus. Well, you don't need protecting against it, or at least probably not, because you've already had it. Yeah, I had it mildly, but still kind of waiting. Well, A, confirmation, did we actually have it? But I think we did. Um, and B, so what? That remains yes. to be answered. Anyway, I haven't. But um, anyway, there we are. This is a new format for us. Um, so, Mark, what I want to talk about today is this new film that's just come out on the life and ideas of David Bohm called Infinite Potential. Not everyone's probably aware of Bohm because he's not one of the most famous scientists uh, like Einstein, but he was a very important and influential quantum physicist. And I think went way beyond most other scientists in, in his deep thinking about the nature of reality, consciousness, and indeed science. And I think the film brings that out really clearly. It's an, a surprisingly good documentary film. I'd expected it to be just talking heads. And of course, there are some talking heads, but it's very well made. And I think that it also brings out the historical context where Bohm comes up with an interpretation of quantum theory as a young man who was a brilliant mathematician at Princeton, the protege of Einstein, um, his spiritual uh, successor in many people's view. Uh, but then he goes against the predominant view uh, among quantum physicists, particularly Robert Oppenheimer. And then I think it's very telling the way that when he publishes his paper on the quantum potential, showing that instead of being just random events, quantum phenomena may have a guiding field underlying them, an invisible underlay, guiding principles which give them shape or form, um, something that wasn't the way other quantum physicists thought, but which works perfectly well with the mathematics. And when Oppenheimer convened a meeting to say, we've got to try and refute Bohm, and when they found they couldn't refute him, then he said, okay, then we just ignore him. Yeah. And Bohm was from then on cast out from the scientific uh, establishment. Um, he was driven out of the United States because he'd had some tenuous link at some stage with some communist uh, party people, forced into exile in Brazil, later uh, in, in, in England. Um, and so his life was completely transformed um, by this persecution by the science establishment. But he then, uh, it, in a way, it was a blessing because he then went on this quest to find a deeper meaning and understanding, particularly of consciousness which quantum theory raises as, as a question. Um, and then his long friendship with Krishnamurti and his many dialogues with Krishnamurti. All this, the film brings out, I think, really well and raises uh, a number of deep questions about the nature of science, the scientific process, the relations between science and consciousness, and the deeper issues in quantum theory. Um, and. Uh, I thought to achieve all those things in a single film was quite remarkable. Yeah, no, I agree about the quality of the film. I was really pleasantly surprised by that and could just relax and enjoy it. Um, it's got the talking heads. I mean, you know, big talking heads, people like Roger Penrose. Um, it's got a lot of good use of archival material. Um, it tells this tragic story, actually, of his ostracization um, uh, from the US. Um, and, but also has wonderful graphics and really tries to communicate his ideas, his way of understanding quantum theory, which, um, you know, is quite hard to understand. I mean, I did a physics degree and um, I remember vaguely hearing about the Bohm formalism of quantum theory and being told that the maths was, you know, way beyond most postgrads maths capability as well. So it has this sort of slightly daunting feel, I think. Um, but actually, you know, um, can um, be shown um, the basic ideas of it uh, quite well. And they also show how um, it's being tested during Bohm's own time when he came to Birkbeck here in London. But it's ongoing now, actually, the work's ongoing. There are people trying to 
um, or both get the funding, but also um, perform the experiments that can show the validity of his formalism um, of the quantum theory. Um, I mean, one thing that I really liked about it as well that um, I felt came across very strongly is how um, the different key figures working on quantum mechanics drew on their perception of reality, whether that be psychological or, or more overtly spiritual, in order to shape um, the way they developed the mathematics of the quantum theory. You know, so Bohm, as you say, through his dialogues with Krishnamurti particularly, um, had this powerful sense of the links between observer and observed, um, and also the idea of something implicate, therefore unfolding into the explicate and then folding back into it. Um, that was a perception that comes from spiritual practice um, that can then be shown to stand up as a way of accounting for quantum phenomena. Um, but, you know, conversely, someone like uh, Niels Bohr, um, you know, the don't ask, just calculate approach, that represents a take on reality. It's not, as it were, implicit in the quantum theory. It's an approach you take to the evidence and the mathematics to try and make an account that stands up. You know, and then I guess figures like Heisenberg, who represent a different take again, um, you know, famous for the sense of uncertainty at the root of all things, and that, of course, I, uh, Einstein so much disliked. That came, again, from a different tradition, a different kind of philosophical account of reality. And so the film showed for me very much how thinking that quantum physics somehow proves something about reality gets it all wrong. Um, that this is already a kind of multi-layered approach to reality. And the physicists take all they've got into their investigations. Um, and there's a much more complex interweaving of all these things. And, you know, as someone like Krishnamurti clearly had, if you have a perception of reality informed by spiritual practice, you should have the confidence of your own perceptions, want to investigate, want to test, want to make links for sure, but not as it were reach for a bit of otherwise quite poorly understood quantum mechanics in order to try and make it prop up. And so David Bohm feels a key figure for me now for that reason, if no other, that he was very clearly trying to bring together different perceptions of reality. One worked out in the lab, one worked out in the mind, um, and, and see where that takes us. And, you know, it takes him in very, very rich directions. Yes. He was, I, I had several, I mean, I knew him fairly well. I had quite a number of dialogues with him, some just private discussions, but, um, some uh, more to do with the relation between my own ideas in science and his. Um, we first met through Krishnamurti, um, who invited me to go and stay at his place in, in Ojai, California, when David Bohm was there. He used to spend quite a lot of time with Krishnamurti. And we took part in a, a film, which is still online, a, a, a discussion about the nature of the mind with a psychiatrist me, Bohm, Krishnamurti, and the psychiatrist. Um, so, um, and then we had some dialogues uh, there, at, at sort of under the aegis of Krishnamurti. Um, um, we had some without Krishnamurti. One of them was on morphic resonance and the implicate order. David Bohm was very friendly to me. Um, I think because it was shortly, uh, we, we met maybe six months after I'd suffered a similar um, thing with, with the scientific world, the, the famous editorial in Nature on, uh, called A Book for Burning about my book, which uh, was an attempt to expel or excommunicate me from the scientific world. So we both, we'd undergone somewhat similar personal experiences. So uh, we both had a kind of fellow feeling uh, for the other. So when I met Bohm, uh, there was this, we got on very well. I mean, he wasn't uh, antagonistic to morphic resonance at all. In fact, he wanted to try and explore how this idea uh, could relate to the implicate order. And the reason I was there with Krishnamurti was because Krishnamurti liked the idea of morphic resonance because part of his teaching was that if one person undergoes a, transformation, a spiritual transformation, that makes it easier, easier for others to do it. He used to say, I am humanity. So if one person 
whose part of humanity undergoes this change, it affects everyone else at a distance. So, um, there were, and it was a very productive dialogue because at first his idea on the implicate order was that um, the implicate order is unfolded from this invisible realm. And my critique of that to him was that this looked like another form of Neoplatonism, if there's just an unfolding from an invisible realm that's primarily mathematical, um, then um, it's just a one-way process. And so I, I said, well, what about folding back in from the ex explicate order to the implicate order and therefore modifying the implicate order, giving it a kind of memory? And indeed, that's what we agreed that would be the best way of seeing it. And so it ended up with a version of the implicate order with memory built in. So if rats learn a new trick in London, then rats in New York should learn it quicker because it's been folded into the implicate order. Um, and so what I call morphic resonance, he could call a, a kind of memory within the implicate order. So actually we arrived at a way in which these two seemingly very different ideas converge. And I still think this is the most promising bridge between morphic resonance and quantum theory. Um, so I personally have a, a, a kind of investment in Bohm's approach because it's the most friendly to my own way of thinking and the one that makes a bridge most clearly. Um, the trouble is of course that Bohm's ideas are not widely accepted within physics largely for these cultural and historical reasons. Um, if he'd come 10 years earlier when quantum theory was still being formulated and stuff, he, he, he might have had a greater influence than coming on the scene when he was a young man and there were already these established figures who were bringing their own world views to bear on it. Um, so um, I think it still provides a potential way forward, um, but it's, it, it goes way beyond the realm of just quantum physics because quantum physics is still about microphysical things, electrons going through uh, double slits or photons going through double slits. I mean, it's still about the, the microphysics of the very small. And what's needed is a way of a more holistic picture of organization that's not just about the smallest possible events. I mean, after all, the quantum of action is the smallest possible unit of physical change. So it's dealing with the very, very smallest of things. Um, and to try and explain the rest of reality in terms of quantum physics is another kind of reductionism. It's saying the smallest is best and everything else has to be explained in terms of that. Now, Bohm's attitude was not reductionist um, and he'd moved on in a way in his thinking far beyond quantum physics. Indeed, he was interested in the dynamics of social groups. He had a, a, an idea of structuralist conversations. He did experiments on structuralist dialogues, not very successful experiments in my experience, because I went to one or two. Um, uh, but he was trying to form a much more holistic view of reality, grounded in his understanding of quantum physics and of consciousness. Yeah, no, my sense is that the culture is moving that way, that you have to have lots of different levels um, that you then build up a picture of how they might interact rather than just dropping straight to the smallest. Um, I mean, I wanted to mention about how his interaction with Owen Barfield, who's such an influential figure on me too, because that maybe illuminates something of what you're saying in another way. But, but first, just, just to pick up on something, because, you know, Einstein was um, a great advocate of Bohm's approach. And as I understand it, part of the reason why Einstein liked, liked Bohm's approach was because it, um, reintroduced an element of determinism into the quantum physics and that there wasn't particularly the Heisenberg uncertainty and that God doesn't play dice in Einstein's famous <laughs> remark. And I just wondered how that relates to what you were describing there about the outfolding but then the infolding as well and memory um, because yeah and you know because I think that strictly speaking just pure, and this is they show this in the film that you can show how the particle, say, moving through the double slits is actually following um, a quantum potential um, that guides its way. So it's determinist in that way. It's not just, as it were, leaping somehow randomly between quantum states. Um, but how does that relate to the folding back in, which feels like it's not 
deterministic um, because it's bringing in, you might say, new information from higher um, dimensions of experience. Well, you see, I think the quantum potential is somewhat ambiguous because at first, in his first formulation of it, which is what got him into trouble with Oppenheimer and people, um, it's a kind of deterministic hidden variable. And quantum physics said they thought that you couldn't have hidden variables. Uh, he has this hidden potential field that guides these quantum processes, the movement of a photon or an electron. Um, well, I personally, I think that morphic fields, as I understand them, the, uh, I think they're hidden variables in, at all levels of organization, not just the level of the quantum potential of a, of a single electron. I think there's a sort of field of hidden variables that guides quantum processes in molecules, in cells, in tissues, in organs, in brains. Um, all these processes in nature are indeterminate. Um, and the menu that we've got in modern science says, you know, either it's determinate or if it's indeterminate, it's basically random. I mean, it's probabilistic. There's a probability distribution. Um, but uh, what Bohm was pointing to is the fact that in what seems to be random, there could be an underlying order that shapes the pattern of the randomness. In this case, the double slit experiment giving wave patterns and, uh, that you can record on a film. Um, that, um, that there might be hidden, uh, the quantum potential field may be like the morphic field uh, that all levels of organization, there may be fields that shape what would otherwise be random or probabilistic processes, pushing them in one direction rather than another. It's still within the realm of what's possible from the point of view of the openness of probability distributions. The probability distribution doesn't cause uh, what happens uh, exactly in any given event. For example, it would be uh, flipping a coin. You know, there's a 50-50 chance every time you flip the coin. But to say you were doing something that really mattered and you were flipping a coin to save your life or flipping a coin to, where, to make millions of pounds, you could be lucky and get a, a run of coin flips that suit your purposes, it's still within the probability distribution. It may be unlikely, but it's still possible. Um, so it's possible to bias probabilities, perhaps not in the long run over long periods, but um, I, I think that uh, how morphic fields work is through biasing probabilities, through having a kind of underlying field uh, that shapes them. And that's very like or Bohm's quantum potential field is the closest thing in physics to that view. Yeah, so to, to use another word which you use, would the quantum potential field be almost like the kind of habits of the quantum world? Well, I think so, yeah. I mean, that's how I'd see it, you see. But when Bohm did his first calculations, this you know, when he was still at Princeton, it was a rather abstract, deterministic type of structure that was, came out of pure mathematics. It didn't have any feedback in it. The idea of a feedback from the explicate order, the implicate and explicate order idea came later, I mean much later than his early quantum potential work. Yeah. So the, the, the idea of a feedback and habits wasn't there in his original formulation, but it was there in his later thinking. Uh, where there could be this kind of morphic uh, resonance uh, aspect. There could be this habitual aspect. Yeah, and I think it's in the later stages, in the 1970s, that um, he had his conversations with Owen Barfield, um, which incidentally I got a transcription of and have put up on my website. So I'll, I'll put a link up to that if anyone's interested in reading them. But they first made contact through their interest in language because of course Bohm also tried to devise a language that could capture some of this sense of multi-dimensional flow as he put it um, and interrelationality folding and unfolding um, and Barfield too felt that language is an expression of um, a dynamic he, he referred to um, language having a kind of soul a vitality um, an intelligence that's alive that is relating and reacting and um, that we can become co-authors, co-creators with when we reach for language um, in all the different ways that we do. And they um, both also were very fascinated by the role of the imagination 
I think Bohm actually preferred words like insight, um, but nonetheless, um, the idea that the imagination is a way that um, shapes the nature of the folding and the unfolding, um, so that when you get an insight in science, for example, um, you nudge the unfolding from the implica order in a slightly different direction. Um, so a new perception becomes possible in the explicate field. Um, and that chimed very much with Barfield's notion of that's what imagination does. That imagination is our relating and interacting with um, much wider processes than just going on in our own mind, um, but helping to shape and form and extend and expand them. Um, it's becoming co-creators with ultimately um, the divine in that Neoplatonic take on things. Um, you know, so, so much so that they had these conversations and then there was a fesh shrift to Barfield that Bohm contributed to as well. Um, so, you know, if nothing else, showing how Bohm reached to language and notions of the imagination and insight um, as absolutely crucial parts of this endeavor as well, that, you know, insight is not just a scientist or someone else having a kind of random good idea, um, but there is somehow something we can cultivate, we can engage with much more interactively as we try and understand and develop ideas either within science or more generally within life. Yes, I mean, Bohm was, probably his most important theoretical book is Wholeness and the Implicate Order. And there he's very keen to, shoot, to invent new languages to express the fact that all of reality is in a state of flow that our language normally, and indeed mathematics, tends to chop it up into sort of static bits. Um, but actually there's this underlying flow, which he called the holo movement, or the Rio mode. The, the, um, so, <coughs> excuse me. Um, he, he had, uh, so he had this sense of flow um, and tried to make these new words for it. Um, I think one of the strange things about Bohm was that it was as if he was trying to reinvent the whole of philosophy. I mean, for example, the philosopher Bergson has a tremendous emphasis on the importance of flow, and his whole book, Creative Evolution, is about this flow principle. Um, and yet, Bohm didn't seem to, I mean, he never mentioned Bergson to me. I mean, when I talked to him about Plotinus and, you know, Neoplatonism, this idea of an ultimate re invisible realm from which things are out, unfolded. Again, it didn't seem to register. It, curiously, he didn't seem to know, although he thought deeply, he didn't seem to have read much philosophy or know much about Western or Eastern philosophy, except through his conversations with Krishnamurti. Um, and Krishnamurti didn't really refer to philosophers. He, he, his approach was sort of discover it for yourself. So it was a curious way in which Bohm was reinventing concepts and reinventing languages and language and words. Although he went deep into the history of words, he was very keen on etymology. And I can see that would have made him, you know, he and Barfield must have had a lot of overlap there. He was curiously, uninterested in philosophy, I mean, as if it didn't exist or needed to be reinvented. And possibly that was Krishnamurti's influence. Um, but it was strange, because I think if he'd actually read people like Bergson or Whitehead, he may have read Whitehead, I didn't, I, again, I never heard him talk about any philosophers. It was always as if you were starting from where you are now and making it up from scratch. Um, yeah, well, maybe there, if there is a kind of bone revival of some kind, that might be a way it could go. That, um, yeah, I mean, you do get the sense with Krishnamurti that he had such penetrating insights um, from his own psyche, you might say, that um, he had plenty to, to work with, um, you know, um, and just didn't have the curiosity to read elsewhere. Um, but uh, maybe now picking up on some of those links i mean I, it also makes me think about um the resources that might be available within the more romantic traditions of science um that would help develop these things as well um you know much more spontaneously thinking about a whole ecology for example of reality rather than this overly reductive tendency um as well as bringing in the imagination as a much more active 
part of the investigative process um, because you know the subjective and the experiential the imaginative is as much part of the cosmos as the seemingly objective reductive material element as well perhaps that's something that people might pick up on yes well that ties in with our conversation about Jeffrey Kripal too because he's um, one reason he wants to bring the humanities, the arts, into the discussion about the nature of consciousness is precisely because these are realms in which consciousness is explored. That's what's going on. Um, yeah, I mean, it feels to me like, um, it, well, it's very interesting you mentioned, you should mention the word uh, ruhr mode because um, that comes from the, the root, the Greek root, ruo, which means to flow. But it's very interesting that it's actually the same root that we now have our word ruin, um, and it feels to me like the word is almost telling us something that um, what was perceived as a flow in the ancient world um, has become to be seen something that's rather static and even in ruins, um, you know, in terms of reality and life, this reductive sort of fragmented, as you say, um, sort of uh, uh, alienated um, experience of life. And so perhaps recovering the old flow is even in, the words that, uh, well, certainly Barfield and Bohm uh, latched upon as if, um, you know, something is trying to make its presence felt um, in the discussions, you know, that are ongoing. And I hope the film very much um, encourages people to think about that because it, it, it's, both, it, it, it's both weighty but inaccessible. And I thought that was a very good thing to pull off, actually. Yes, and covers so many different dimensions of the personal story the, the um, reactions of the academic and social and, and scientific world, the, the curious relationship he had with Krishnamurti. Um, um, yes, I thought it, it dealt with so many of those issues really well. And I think that, the, as, as we've just been discussing, if Bohm's going to become a, a, an enduring influence, then it has, he has to be related to other things, because both he and Krishnamurti had this th you know, lack of historical, di di apart from the history of words in Bohm's case, you know, not relating to the history of philosophy. Krishnamurti rejected all religious frameworks, so he didn't really relate what he was saying to the Upanishads or to the Buddhist, the Buddhist teachings and so on. Um, so it was like contextless. Um, and um, I think that Bohm, when put into context, actually would become um, more helpful and more part of an ongoing process of discovery. And I think this film, by bringing his story, many aspects of which, I mean, although I knew him personally and read his books, I, a lot of that I didn't know. And I think it brings together things in a really illuminating way. And for people who don't know about Bohm, it's a fantastic introduction. And for people who do know about him, it gives a much greater appreciation of what he was doing. Yeah, well, I completely agree. And, you know, maybe it's something that the Western approach, which is much more interested in making links, drawing on um, traditions and ideas, you know, rather than the kind of direct sort of avatar experience um, that someone like Krishnamurti, um, I guess, represented. Um, that's something which, um, uh, you know, the approaches, the, the Western approaches can bring to the Eastern insights in a, in a fruitful dialogue as well. Hmm. Good. Well, thank you, Mark. Thank you.